Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Graff, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief at National Jeweler. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jeweler's webinar series sponsored by RDI Diamonds. Today's session is hosted by our Senior Editor, Brecken Brandstrader, and features Helen Moldsworth, a gemologist and jewelry historian. Before I turn it over to Brecken to get the webinar started, I just wanted to let our attendees know that if they have the question, they can type it into the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler website this coming Friday. Now I'll turn it over to Brecken and Helen, and I'll be back to field any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that introduction, and happy Tuesday to all our viewers. Um, I can't think of a better way to spend a Tuesday than to be here chatting about Royal Jewels at auction with you, Helen. Um, you've got experience in a lot of sectors in the industry, but as we were chatting about the webinar, we realized that what we both really love to talk about, among many things, is his, these important historic jewels from royalty or nobility going up for auction. Um, and you've had a lot of experience getting to handle and evaluate these pieces as well in your experience. Um, but before we jump into talking about the pieces and that kind of thing, I did want to give you the chance to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background in the gem and jewelry world. Thank you so much, Brecken. Well, I just want to start by saying thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's really nice to be here for National Jeweler, and um, it's just great to be able to talk about something I'm very passionate about with you, which we both are, I think. Um, just to give you a bit of a background on me, I've been in the business now 20 years. I went into the jewelry industry straight out of university where I studied classics, so Latin and Greek. And um, I fell in love with small Roman jewellery at the time and decided that I could do a career in something sort of much more um, commercial with jewellery and started pretty early on in Sotheby's um, on the graduate training scheme and uh, came out to Geneva, where I still am today, and that mm -hmm. was 20 years ago, to start cataloguing the magnificent jewel sales for the Geneva auctions for Sotheby's. And that was the beginning of seeing some of the biggest jewels in the world, I guess. Um, and then, you know, after that, I was in London and Geneva for both Christie's and Sotheby's over a 10 year period with both auction houses. Um, and we'll talk about some of the pieces I've been handling and was lucky enough to be really, really close to, I think, in the next half an hour. Um, and as well as part of my career, I've also been lecturer of uh, history of jewellery here in Geneva as a mm. sort of a professor here. And um, eight years ago, I set up the Google Academy and wrote all the courses and built a business for them on the coloured gemstones. So I've got quite a big gemology experience, <laughs> two sides. One is royal jewels and the other is gemology and gemstones. So it's a very nice mix in our industry, right? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so let's start with the big one then, um, the jewels of Princess Margaret, obviously. And I think, Helen, you have some things to share with us if you want to go ahead and pull those up. You were the specialist in charge of this for the sale at Christie's in 2006. Um, but before we talk about pieces, I wanted to ask you about Sort of what the work that goes into the auction beforehand so specifically for princess margaret what sort of research and valuation what's the process for that like so um actually researching and valuing these sort of sales are, are quite specific they're quite special as you can probably imagine yeah um, and i'm just going to give you a sort of a warning that princess margaret was unique um, this okay. was the sale of the jewels of the sister of the queen of england after she died and they were her private jewels so they obviously didn't belong to the crown, they belonged to the family, which is why they could be sold. Um, and this was a particularly special sale because, I mean, not only was it the queen, uh, the sister of a queen, which just doesn't happen at auction, um, but we were able just to value the pieces as they were worth without the provenance. So that was how we did the valuation. Um, one of the arguments being, how on earth do you know what this sort of jewelry is worth until you start selling it? Yeah. Um, very lucky the family gave us the freedom to value the pieces as they might have been sold as a diamond brooch, a pair of emerald earrings, that sort of thing. Um, so we could then see really what provenance price differences were made on a natural market power. You know, that yeah. was quite an extraordinary chance to have that. Fascinating. So how, how did it do in terms of the pre-sale estimates, say, and what they actually achieved? Um, well, I can give you some of the prices on some of the next screens that I'll show you some of the pieces. But if I tell you that, I think I remember averaging out about 17 to 20 times the, the, the actual normal sale value for the sale results, hammer price without commission. 
And I remember some pieces actually going to 150 times the auction value. Oh my gosh. So there were some really extraordinary results that we had here. Really yeah. extraordinary. Such mm -hmm. a fascinating look into that world, I think. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it, was, it was extraordinary. Really, really extraordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have to know, all the pieces that you, that were in that collection, what was your favorite? Well, like I said, that saying, it was the Pulsimore Tiara. Oh <laughs> and this was just a beautiful piece of jewellery in its own right. It was actually made in the 19th century by Garrard for Lady Pulsimore. And when Princess Margaret got engaged and was going to be married in 1960, they, she purchased this personally at auction in 1959, secondhand. So this is quite an amazing piece. It's a piece that a member of the royal family bought at auction for her own wedding. Um, so it was an antique piece and it was stunning because it came apart into all these different jewels. And you can see on the bottom left, there were clips and brooches. Um, there was a fringe necklace she's wearing on the bottom right. You could wear the clips as hair pieces. But of course, the most magnificent form was as the tiara. And I think um, a lot of people now know this tiara because it was shown in The Crown, the Netflix series. And oh, the amazing. Of Princess Margaret wearing it in the bath. And I think um, Helena Bonham Carter did that scene where they remade it. That is um, the, the best picture of her in the bathtub. Great. And of course, yeah. she was married to a photographer. So Lord Snowden uh, took the pictures. He was a famous photographer. Um, but one of the things I loved about this was how it came to pieces. And, you know, I was very lucky. I was a specialist in charge of the Princess Margaret sale. So I was basically, the jewels were mine to look after, to catalog, to research, and then to travel around the world and England with them. So I had very, very close contact with them. Um, and I remember as soon as I got the Paul Tiara back to the office, I just took it to pieces because I was so excited. Oh my God. But I had a really close call because a very senior uh, uh, journalist was coming in to meet me and I only just got it back together in time. <laughs> it was <laughs> complicated. It was like a yeah. Machine. You know, hand it over in pieces. You're like, here it is. Yeah, exactly. So it's it, it sold for 1.7 million, it says. That's the final hammer price. Exactly. So, wow. you know, it made just under a million pounds and sold for $1.7 million was the equivalent. So okay. it made a spectacular price. We'd actually priced that at 150,000 <gasps> pounds. Oh my gosh. Well, that just doesn't, that doesn't even seem like close to being enough. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Stunning. And so you Absolutely. also wanted to point out some of the other notable pieces from this collection as well? Yeah, I mean, there were so many lovely things. One of the yeah. really special aspects of this sale was... So sorry, I accidentally muted myself. Okay. Um, one of the really special things about this sale was the fact that it was really personal. Um, these were pieces that belonged to an individual who had family who'd given her pieces, who'd bought some for herself and who liked jewellery. So there were small things and there were magnificent things, but part of them you could imagine a, a normal person wearing and owning some of them. Um, right. These aren't necessarily the normal ones because these are <laughs> yeah. pieces. Um, and, but to give you an example of, of one of the pieces which was really personal and you could, you could realize that their family was like any other family. The, the top piece here, the, the Sapphire and Diamond Art Deco brooch, Mm -hmm. I opened the, the, the pieces while I did the valuation when the pieces came out of the safe and there was a note inside that said for darling Margaret on her confirmation day from her loving granny Mary and that was Queen Mary who'd given her this brooch in 1946. So oh there were notes within the jewellery boxes when we started doing the valuation which was just amazing. Wow. Um, and one of the other pieces that had a note in that was, I, 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 this is the moment I will never forget, um, I was asked to go and do the valuation because I was good at research, good at historical things um, by the head of Christie's Jewelry and got sent to Kensington Palace to do the valuation in, you know, in her old apartments. And the pieces were brought out of the safe. And one of the boxes we opened was this one here, the one on the bottom right. Mm -hmm. The uh, beautiful sort of Tiffany colored um, blue box with a diamond riviere, a straight uh, line of diamonds in it, obviously antique. And a note inside said the Lady Poulton, the Poultimorty, excuse me, it said the Lady Mount Stephen. And the Lady Mount Stephen, I just did a bit of research straight away when I got back. And Lady Mount Stephen was actually the lady in waiting to Queen Mary. And she had given her, bequeathed her the pieces. And then Queen Mary had given this necklace to Princess Margaret. Oh my so goodness. So had beautiful sort of really personal connections within, within the jewels in the sale. So let me yeah. ask, obviously with the provenance, it adds something anyway, uh, you know, to the value. And when you have something like that, like an extra piece that's like a note, does that add something as well? 
for when you're well, I mean I think we have to assume it does because for example yeah. the the lady um, Mount Stephen necklace which we valued at sort of 200,000 pounds ended up selling for nearly a million pounds so it's 1.8 million dollars wow um, so obviously that provenance made a big difference you know right. um, but it was also one of the most spectacular pieces that that she wore to special special events um, and then these you know these other pieces on the screen are pieces that I think had a quite personal and quite a, a special connection where I think that probably did help the pricing quite significantly mm -hmm. um, the, I just wanted to show you a few more of these because the, the brooch on the top right the rose brooch was very special because a lot of people didn't realize that Princess Margaret's middle name was Rose. So I'm pretty sure that's why um, she owned such a beautiful rose brooch. It was made by Cartier in uh, 1938 and she actually wore it to the coronation of the queen. So again, another personal but spectacularly important royal piece. Right? Yeah. Um, and the little M, uh, that was just a beautiful brooch. So I think she received her 21st birthday in 1951. That, was a crazy price. It was, it was the end that we actually modeled the stamp that we gave all the jewelry on to prove that it was from Princess Margaret's collection. And um, the actual brooch we valued at three to 5,000 pounds, it mm -hmm. ended up making 187,000 pounds. That was over $300,000. Oh my so God. Think, you know, when you ask about provenance and, and how, how much of a difference it makes, you get some idea of yeah. the difference when you look at these pieces. Is there any way of predicting exactly how much it will add, or is it that completely, um, you know, at the time what the market is willing to? I find that I think in, in this case there was really no precedent right. to the sister of the Queen of Great Britain selling jewelry. Um, so it's very different. I mean, we can look at pieces that have got historic value on them previously, and of course, obviously, a lot of valuations are done based on prior sale results. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to jewellery, the, these sort of pieces are so, they, they're just unique. Um, and that was why we were lucky to have the freedom to just see what the market would, would tell us it was worth. I mean, of course we, right. of course we knew it was going to be crazy yeah, different, the roof. Um, but everybody did, you know, there was no, yeah. no secret about that. Right. Um, and there was just one more piece on this page, which you can see Princess Margaret wearing together with the rose on the top uh, left photo. And that, of course, is the necklace, the pearl necklace, the five rose natural pearls. And this piece was pretty much the one that she wore the most. Mm. Um, you'll see it in nearly all of her Cecil Beaton um, portraits from 1948 onwards. Um, and you, she just she obviously loved this piece of jewellery. Um, and these pearls made half a million dollars. So, again, yeah. that was from an estimate that was about 20,000. So, yeah. you know, the personal pieces here were also spectacular. <laughs> were very oh, my happy. gosh, they're amazing. Quite amazing. Um, and just to, to move on a little bit from Princess Margaret, is there a particular royal piece at auction uh, overall that has stood out to you or was surprising in any way? Um, yeah, and I'm glad you asked me that because I've got some great photos. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, this is one piece of jewellery that I will just never forget. Um, it wasn't very long ago. It was only came up for sale uh, very, very recently here in uh, Geneva, actually, at Sotheby's. And this was a pearl that belonged to Marie Antoinette. She was obviously the last Queen of France. So mm. we're again going to proper royal houses jewellery. Um, and this uh, came to sale through the Bourbon Palmer family, which Sotheby's had the collection of uh, in 2018. And they had 10 pieces in this collection that had come from Marie Antoinette. So 10 pieces that had come from the French royal family. And this, the pearl on the left, was easily one of the most spectacular things that's ever come to auction. Um, it was in the sale of an estimate at one to two million pounds, uh, dollar, one to two million dollars, equivalent Swiss and dollar were quite similar at the time. Mm -hmm. And it ended up selling for 36 million dollars. Oh my gosh. So I think, you can, I even wrote on the catalogue, you can see the back, <laughs> wow, before it had even sold. I was like, this is spectacular. This is going to be jaw dropping. Um, and it made me think of another piece that I'd handled, um, again, back at the time of Princess Margaret, sort of 2006 time, it was 2007. This pearl necklace on the right came up for sale at London at Christie's when we were there. And the pearls were supposedly from also the collection of Marie Antoinette. And the story was that um, they'd been sort of 
looked after by the wife of the British ambassador at the time for safekeeping during the revolution. And then they'd been made up later um, by the English aristocratic family that ended up owning them. Uh, this came in for sale and had a relatively high estimate at the time of 300,000 pounds on it, but it didn't sell. And oh, I find this oh. such an interesting comparison to look at, obviously the quality of the pearl on the left was just spectacular and so much bigger. Right. But to think that something with provenance also very important didn't. And uh, a lot of us at the time were thinking, well, you know, maybe there was just an association that wasn't, that wasn't pleasant. It was too close to the fact that Marie Antoinette had obviously lost her life by guillotine after the revolution. And these were pearls oh. that you were supposed to wear around your neck. So we, we did actually speculate whether there was just something a little bit too, too close home on, the, on this necklace. It was obviously not too cheap either. But I love these comparisons that you can see because you, you ask about provenance and value. Yeah. You never know what affects it, you know? Yeah, that is fascinating. And what, um, out of curiosity, what's the cut of the diamond that's sitting on top of the Marie Antoinette? Is that an old? It was, an, it was just an old cut. It's slightly oval in shape. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can also tell quite a lot by the age of a piece of jewelry or the diamonds in it by how they've been cut. And this right. was quite, a, quite, I think it looked quite low and flat and was oval, but obviously with the slightly bigger facets on the table and again, had a cubit. So that would have been a really early piece. It would have been an 18th century piece of original. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and are there any other major royal figures from history whose jewels you've handled throughout your experience while we're talking about? Well, I've been very lucky. I mean, you know, we started off with looking at some British royal pieces. Uh, this is, you know, the number one person for France is Marie Antoinette. Oh, I think I might even have a few things to say about her again later. Um, but the, the sort of the, the next really big name in jewellery to come up is Catherine the Great. Um, and I, I have been very lucky thinking about this. There have been quite a few pieces of hers that actually I have handled over the years. Um, the one on the left is probably the most spectacular and the most recent. Uh, this was a piece that came up for sale just last year in May 2019 um, in Geneva again. And this was Marie Antoinette's emerald that originally had, uh, sorry, excuse me, Catherine the Great's emerald that had originally been a 100 carat plus step cut emerald um, that we knew belonged to Catherine the Great. And then through Tsar Alexander II, it had been given to Grand Duchess Vladimir. And this was the Grand Duchess who had the Vladimir tiara of pearls that we see in the British Royal uh, Crown Jewels today. Um, and she had one of the most spectacular jewelry collections in the world ever. She was sort of um, the rival to the Tsarina at the time. She had big parties, she was known for a bit of gambling. She was just a rival to the Empress, so her collection of jewels was magnificent. Um, and this emerald, originally the 100 character, was in her collection. Um, and the story went that when you know the revolution happened and the, they were escaping the palace, and Grand Duchess Vladimir did escape, um, they left the jewels behind. And an English army officer had to go back in disguise as a workman and escaped with this in a plastic bag, pretending it was nothing. Um, so these pieces came back into uh, Europe and um, this was actually sold to Cartier where it got recut into a pear shape to really reduce the flaws in it. Apparently it was either damaged or just too included. Um, so this then has now been recut into our um, 75 carat pear shape emerald. 75, wow. John Rockefeller and finally came up for auction and sold for $4.3 million. So that was wow. quite a mix. Yeah. And then the others, and these ones I love because they were really proper 18th century jewelry. You know, the emerald we've had recut and remounted. Um, the amethyst earrings on the top, uh, I catalogued those in Geneva um, back in 2007 when I was um, in Christie's. And uh, they were um, provenance back to Catherine the Great from the Imperial Russian Crown Jewels. And they sold for sort of $400,000 as opposed to an estimate of 100. And then the two little brooches, which were just beautiful. Um, if anybody knows the Royal, the, the, the Imperial Jewelry Collection of Russia, there were quite often lots of little brooches that were sold, maybe that, that, were, that were made together, sort of a dozen of them. And they, there were several of these little pretty little flower brooches um, one of them had come up for sale in England in London several years ago, and we had this pair um, in London in 2006, so the same year as, as Princess Margaret, um, and these sold for £100,000. It's two, two little dinky brooches, but just oh my so God. pretty. Yeah. 
and they probably would have been sewn onto um, the dresses, not just as brooches too. Right. Really lovely pieces, really cool. They're beautiful. I have a particular fondness for the amethyst earrings, I think because you don't see a stone like that, you know, necessarily set like that or appearing in auction, but the, the color is beautiful. And is it because they're sourced? They came You've from? obviously got a very good eye for gemstones because these would have probably been the Siberian Russian amethysts that were uh -huh. the best. So of course, being Russian earrings, they were quite likely the, the Russian gems. And these were supposed to be the best amethysts. That, They're that gorgeous. Amethysts. So you got very good, very good taste, Brett. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, and so we talked about your favorite pieces within Margaret's collection, obviously, and other pieces of note. But do you have a favorite royal jewel at auction overall, or even maybe a favorite royal whose pieces you've seen at auction? I do. I mean, I have to say, obviously, Princess Margaret would probably be my my single number one because it's such a personal collection for me, and I really lived with it. Um, and got to know it very well. And obviously these two ladies have had spectacular collections, but there's there's one um, royal lady who I just, firstly, her photographs, absolutely drop dead, beautiful and stunning. Yes. Um, but had a fabulous uh, love of and collection of jewels. And this was Queen Marie Jose of Belgium. Um, you just need to look at that picture and think how spectacular, right? So she was the daughter of King Albert I of Belgium. And then she married Umberto II of Italy, which meant she was the last queen of Italy. And this is also something I just find, you know, as part of the history and the connection to jewelry and power and what these things signify, to be the last queen of a country and the last king. She was nicknamed the May Queen because she only was queen and they ruled for just over a month. Um, ah. There was actually, yeah, it was an extraordinary story. Um, Umberto's father had been very unpopular because he'd made some very bad political decisions during the war um, and refused to abdicate. And Umberto II and uh, Queen Marie Jose had been much more popular, but only got to take over when it was too late and there was going to be a vote to abolish the monarchy. And the vote said, 50, I think it was 54 to 46 percent or something. Monarchy is ah. over. So, um, you know, these two were, were king and queen for something like 35 or something, just over a few a month's days. And some of her pieces that have come up for auction in uh, the last few years, honestly, have been spectacular. Um, the ruby ring, just, uh, it was catalogued by one of the uh, gem labs as a very exceptional treasure. <laughs> and this was given to her when they got engaged. It was a wedding gift from an Italian uh, book collector, I think from Naples. Um, the Italians liked this couple so much that they got wedding gifts sent in from all around Italy. Wow. Um, and one of these was this ruby ring. It was an eight carat Burmese pigeon blood ruby. That was just, I mean, it was beautiful, but it had a very steep estimate put on it sale. It had six to 8 million and it didn't sell. So this six is also million? very, sorry? What was the pre-sale estimate? Uh, it was six to eight million Swiss francs, which again okay. is close to the dollar. So it wasn't mm -hmm. cheap. It was put in very high, but obviously that had been to account for the provenance. Mm -hmm. um, but you look at ruby prices today and you wonder, um, right. or at least you know, last year at least. Um, but it's an example of, you know, provenance isn't an always, doesn't always tick the boxes. So this was a piece right. that sadly didn't sell. Wow. Um, but of course it was a beautiful, beautiful ruby with a great story. Um, and talking of great stories, I think some of you might know this beautiful tiara by Fabergé because it's actually in the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences because it was bought by, um, I think it was the McFerrins who were the biggest, some, some of the world's biggest Fabergé collectors and then they put it on display brilliantly. I mean, how great to share. And this uh, Fabergé tiara was nicknamed the Josephine, the Empress Josephine tiara because going back to sort of French jewels, uh, it was said that the Briolette diamonds, which are the ones dropping from the center hoops, mm -hmm. um, which all swung in the light, um, were a gift from Tsar Alexander I to the Empress Josephine, who he used to visit after she divorced Napoleon and give her gifts. Um, and then they, these Briolettes were handed down to her son. Uh, it was made into the Fabergé tiara and it ended up being um, bought after the war by the Belgian royal family and that's how Queen Marie Jose ended up with it um, wow. and then this came up for auction I think it was I mean I remember being at Christie's in Geneva um, in 2007 
And this was a really interesting story of value. I remember seeing this and just thinking, a million dollars. You know, that was right. the first thing I remember thinking. And one of my colleagues um, did the valuation on it and just did the diamond weight and didn't want to change the diamond weight. So it was estimated at $400,000 um, by one person. It actually went in for sale at about 800 and finally made $2 million, which was oh my goodness. really much better price, you know. So what's the, to do you know the total carat weight? That, that when you say that they, they went just, that's just what they went off in terms of I when they were- I can't it. remember for the life of oh, me. Okay. That would have to be like yeah. checking it all up. Yeah. Um, but you know, wow. it was a significant amount of diamonds, clearly. Yeah. But Fabergé, French royal history, and then, you know, more modern, European royal history it's just it's a dream piece of jewelry right yeah so you knew it was going to blow that price away absolutely it's quite beautiful and I love the idea of the movement of those briolettes to bring it to life I love I like the idea that I could go see it in Houston I mean that's amazing I would, I would love to see that it chance that often. <laughs> yeah I mean that's clear, that's clearly one for post-covid uh, travel wishes right right there we go <laughs> that sounds great um and so to move away from jewels for a second, we've obviously talked about the royal jewels at auction, but we also know that a lot of loose stones uh, with royal or noble provenance also hit the block. So let's talk a little bit about what happens in that case. How do you value those with the provenance like that? And then maybe just what are some of the most exceptional ones you've seen go to auction before? You see, that's a really good question because obviously it's a, it's a totally different thing, valuing a piece of jewelry and valuing a single stone. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, with the jewel, as we've just said, with this Fabergé tiara, you've got an intrinsic break price, right? You could actually work out what all the stones are worth. And of course, every good specialist starts with that or at least knows what that is. Um, so, you know, you do start with this single stone price in jewels. Mm -hmm. But when you look at a piece of jewelry, you've got to take into account its aesthetic value, maybe again, the, the, the family value, because the jewel would have been worn. Loose stones, right. not necessarily so much. But there are some very nice examples of um, single diamonds. I've just picked a, a handful of the single diamonds I've uh, handled through the auctions through the years. Um, and you know, when it comes to the, the valuation, you can see the prices here and I'll, I'll tell you about them, but the actual uh, price, you have to start with what the diamond would be worth. I mean, that's a very important aspect. You've got to know the value of the diamond. Right. Um, but obviously you've got to take into account that it's also come from a fantastic background because if these stones have got an important background they might have the historic value of where the mine was as well as who owned them um, and quite often these older pieces are by nature very high quality so that actually is a knock-on quality effect as well um, one very interesting one thinking about value and I think uh, I'll start with that on this page um, I wonder if people will recognize the top right um, this one here the Wittelsbach graph diamond and that was the most spectacular um, 35 carat fancy deep grayish blue stone that came up for sale uh, in 2012 at Christie's here in Geneva and I'll tell you personally I remember picking up this stone and looking at it and just feeling like a part of my stone and my soul had sort of been sucked out and just <laughs> absorbed in the depths of this blue pool I just I felt like it had it had sort of taken a part of me it was just such a powerful <laughs> stone um and and this stone you know was estimated uh, probably quite close to the actual value because a lot of these pieces when they're competitive at auction you can't undervalue them when lots of people want to sell them yeah um, and it finally sold at uh, 23 million dollars to lawrence graff and lawrence graff quite famously recut the stone to a 31 character getting rid of the gray and making it a pure fancy deep blue. And that of course changed the value. Right. So, I mean, obviously at one point you're losing, or at least a lot of the purists felt like you're losing the historic form of it. Right. But you're increasing the value of the diamond color. So this is an interesting one where provenance versus intrinsic value. Right. It's quite, quite a balance. Yeah. That was a very interesting stone when you're looking at pricing. Um, it, it said that he sold it thereafter for about four times the amount, um, possibly. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, there was a very pretty little blue comparatively on the top left. That was the Farnese blue. 
um, and that belonged to Spanish, French, Italian, Austrian royal families through its history, went back to the 1700s. Um, and that was a fancy dark grey blue, it was a much darker stone, and that sold for 6.7 million. Um, the estimate was 3 million, so again, we're looking at, at quite a jump. Right. Um, and then uh, a couple of the other stones on here, um, the bottom left was a very light pink. It was the, the Grand Mazarin, the, the Great Mazarin diamond, which was in the collection of Cardinal Mazarin, who was sort of the chief minister in France in the 17th century um, under Louis the Fourteenth, and, and that's who then owned it. Um, and it went into the French crown jewel. So this became a French crown jewel. Napoleon got his hands on it. Um, it, and it then got sold when the French crown jewels were sold off in 1887 to Frederick Boucheron of the Boucheron, um, yeah, of the Boucheron name. Uh -huh. um, and finally it came up for sale at Christie's and that sold for 14 million. Um, that was 19 carats. Am I, am I listing all of these gems? I'm nearly, I'm nearly done on those. Um, and then the, the middle one, which I can remember, landed on my desk when I was uh, working in Geneva. And the head of the department just sort of put it on my desk and went, it's yours now, go on research. Um, I know that was a competitive stone because it wasn't sold with where I was at the time. <laughs> um, but this was the uh, Petit Sancy or the Beau Sancy to distinguish it from the Sancy, which was another stone. Um, and this was owned um, by initially uh, Nicolas de Harle, who was a 16th century nobleman, owned by Marie de Medici, then it ended up in the British crown jewels and then the Prussian crown jewels um, and finally ended up at Sotheby's in auction in 2012 for nearly 10 million dollars. Wow. What a lineup, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah and then the last one which is um, my personal favorite because this again goes back to your pricing question so right. I'm getting around about <laughs> onto the, <laughs> the pricing value. Um, this was the Archduke Joseph, which was a 76 carat DIF Golconda Type 2A. So it was just a perfect diamond. Um, and it went back to the first sort of proven provenance was I think 1933, the Archduke Joseph had deposited in a Hungarian bank vault. And it came up for sale at Christie's um, in 2012 with an estimate of $15 million. When it sold for $21 million, that was $280,000 per carat. And it's still the world record price per carat for a white diamond today. Wow. If you look at $280,000 per carat for a white stone, we weren't looking at anything over $200,000 for white diamonds. So this is a brilliant example of where you can actually see direct provenance relating to price shifts. Right. It's so interesting with the loose stones, especially how much it adds. That's amazing. That's a great example. Thank you for that, Helen. Those are beautiful. Um, and, you know, one more question before we throw it over to uh, our audience Q&A. I wanted to just briefly touch on the American market. So obviously um, America doesn't have royalty per se, but I think it's safe to say that we tend to treat our A-list celebrities as our royalty. And when a celebrity jewelry collection goes to auction, they're, they're definitely big headlines and people are really fascinated by it. So which um, American celebrity collectors going to auction have been of note to you? So there's, there's one, and again, number one, like we've had the number one so far, <laughs> the number one American collector oh, has to yeah. be the inimitable Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I mean, she was obviously one of the most beautiful women and most successful actresses that ever lived, um, with uh, probably some of the highest numbers of marriages and divorces, um, but also one of the most famous jewelry collectors in the world. And she had pearls, emeralds, ruby sapphires that all broke records when her collection came up for sale um, at Christie's in 2011. And I've just got a few of the pieces um, on the screen that if you don't mind me talking about, I, I'd love to take the stories. Oh, yes. Um, so the very famous La Pellegrina Pearl, um, even if this happened to have been Miss Taylor's pearl, this is the most perfect pearl I've ever seen. Um, really? I was very lucky I got to handle the whole collection and this pearl particularly because I was working on other pearls at the time. And this pearl was just honestly the most perfect pearl in the world, the shape, everything. Um, and it went back again to royal provenance because this belonged to King Philip II of Spain. So it was in the Spanish um, royal families at one point. Um, and do they know where it came from, like where it originated, I guess? The question. Um, well, you look at pearls like this and you assume they have to be 
probably Gulf, and there are a couple of other origins that they could be. Um, mm -hmm. But something like this, um, you need to do a lot more, a lot more gemological. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of all of these sort of further eastern pearl localities where it might have come from. Um, but this one ended up sort of in um, British aristocratic families and it actually got lost a couple of times. Um, the lady who owned it was Louisa Hamilton. She dropped it behind a sofa um, at Windsor Castle, didn't find it for a while, and then lost it at a ball at Buckingham Palace. Oh my. And, um, you know, these are lesser known stories because the story that everybody knows about this pearl getting lost is the one where Elizabeth Taylor herself had lost the pearl and she was sitting with Richard Burton and just, just it had fallen off the, the, the mount it was on. And she looked everywhere, couldn't find it. And she was desperate that he was gonna absolutely go ballistic. And she found her little puppy was just chewing on it um, on the floor. And she pulled it out oh of his God. mouth and said, thank God it wasn't wrecked, it wasn't scratched. Um, so, you know, that's sort of one of the fun stories that adds. And, and this of course made the world record for pearls at the time. Right. Which was then tripled by Marie Antoinette's $36 million pearl. <laughs> The ruby I love because um, this just sort of, it appeals to my British sense of humor, I think, uh, and the emerald too, to a certain extent. Um, the ruby was given to uh, Liz by Richard Burton, I think her most famous husband, um, mm -hmm. as a stocking filler at Christmas. When he oh. met her, he said, I'm going to get you the most perfect ruby, but it has to be perfect. And one of the reasons that apparently he said this is, and I like red because I'm Welsh and red was the colour for Wales. So that was one of the sort of the jokes behind why he wanted such a good ruby. Um, and wow. that when it sold for sort of $4.2 million, up to half a million dollars a carat, made the world record price for rubies. And at the time, I remember thinking that doesn't count because again, it's a provenance piece. It's to do with her value, it's to do with right. the provenance value of Liz Taylor. But the reality was, um, ruby prices started actually completely coming in with that level of value and we started hitting a million dollars a carat for other rubies so I think it was probably a fair a fair price actually oh Which interesting nice. yeah wow what a stocking stuffer I'm gonna ask Santa for that this year too I know isn't it ideal <laughs> and it's such a classic setting too it's just a beautiful piece Yes, it was beautiful I think that one was by Van Cleef um, mm. but obviously one of her biggest jewelry houses behind the collection was Bulgari and um, this was <laughs> sort of uh, where the emerald comes in it was a Bulgari piece uh, 24 23 carats that uh, Richard Burton gave to her on her, their engagement and she wore to their wedding um, and actually that fits in perfectly with the the, the, the last quote I just wanted to tell you um, again this British sense of humor Richard Burton apparently said well I introduced Liz to beer and she introduced me to Bulgari. And I always thought, what a, what a great deal. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, what an amazing collection. What a fantastic like opportunity. I mean, it's just the, the look into these people's lives as well, I think is so fascinating when it goes to auction and it suddenly people have a chance to sort of own it. It's amazing. It truly is really That's it, isn't it? And also yeah. it gives you an insight into, into the, the personal aspect and the, and, the human, and the human aspect. And you realize that through some of these stories, We've all misplaced a piece of jewelry. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, we may not have found a four million dollar ruby in our stockings, but True. you know, there's all these personal interactions that you can you can imagine. And that's yeah. I think, one of the most charming things about these. Absolutely. Well, thank you for those, Helen. That was amazing. Um, Michelle, I think we're ready to kick off the audience QA whenever you are. Okay, thank you so much. I could have listened to that all day. It was so interesting. And we definitely have a few uh, fans of the crown in the audience today, just so you know, Helen. <laughs> um, so thanks to you both. Uh, and thanks to our sponsor, RDI Diamonds. As a reminder, you can still type questions into the Zoom Q&A box. That is the box at the bottom of the screen with the two little uh, thought bubbles above it. And I'll try to get to as many of those as possible. We've had quite a few questions and comments come in. Um, while you two were talking. Uh, while we compile the Q&A, I just wanted to say a quick word about RDI Diamonds. Uh, RDI Diamonds, the selection you want, the quality you need. Thousands of diamonds, that's just the beginning. RDI offers a wide range of services and support to help you succeed. From flexible memo options, a partnership with the Beers Group Industry Services, to generous stock options and cost-efficient shipping. RDI's goal is to provide the highest quality of both care and diamonds to your store. 
visit rdidiamonds.com today to learn more. That is rdidiamonds.com. Uh, now let's get started with our listener questions. Like I, as I mentioned, we've had quite a few. Um, so the I just want to start uh, with one about Princess Margaret. So just for background for everybody, Princess Margaret is a sister and actually only sibling of the current Queen of England, Elizabeth II, and she died in 2002 at the age of 71. Um, I was curious, this is a question for me, why did Princess Margaret buy her own tiara to wear at her wedding? Because I know when we report on the kind of the millennial royals, if you will, you know, we always notice what you know, Kate or Megan or Eugenie, like they're always, you know, borrowing something from the Queen's collection. So why did Princess Margaret buy her own? I have to say, that's a super interesting question. Um, and it's one I can't give you a complete answer to. But the, the understanding I have is that she didn't have her own tiara. Um, and as the sister of the Queen of England, yes, she could borrow pieces. Um, but she wasn't a direct descendant or in line to the throne. So the, the idea of using today, you know, we see Kate and various people using them. That's often used as a way of really promoting the royal family and showing family history. Um, Princess Margaret was always a little bit of a rebel. And she obviously didn't have her own tiara. She obviously loved jewellery. And I think, I think part of it was to have her own tiara. And I have to say, I love that. The idea that, you know, you can be a member of the royal family and still buy your own jewellery. You know, it's girl power. I mean, she obviously didn't have her own <laughs> power <laughs> so I think that was it I think it was to have her own her own jewel that she could wear whenever she wanted okay thank you um the next uh, another princess Margaret question um so the pieces we talked about today that you showed Helen were personally owned by princess Margaret so her heirs received the proceeds when they were sold at auction Yes, that's exactly what happened. Um, to be quite honest, it was, you know, it's very difficult in Britain. I don't know how it works in America, but there's death duties, um, especially on large estates. So when she died, there were quite, I think, enormous death duties, to be honest. And uh, there were two children and they had to work out how to split the collection. So one of the difficulties is if you've got pieces that you don't actually know the value, as we were talking, Brecon, and you can't necessarily give the value until you see what the market tells you, how were you ever gonna split it? Um, so that was one reason. And the other was, of course, like I said, the death duty. So they had to settle um, a certain amount of quite enormous taxes after the sale. And this was one way of doing it through the proceeds. Um, it was also you know, a very nice way of being able to um, sort of pay tribute to Princess Margaret's life. And I think that the, the children appreciated that, that we could put together something very beautiful, showing what she had, putting all the jewelry together, and then obviously pragmatically using it for their needs as well. Uh, you might not know the answer to this, but did her children keep any of her jewelry? I do know the answer to that, and I can say yes, um, because I saw the whole collection and they kept oh certain pieces. Um, one piece, well, there's several pieces that you still see her daughter wearing, a pair of pearl earrings, which she just loved um, and wears quite a bit. Um, but my favorite piece, uh, which goes back to the Rose brooch story I was telling you about her middle name being Rose, actually Princess Margaret's engagement ring was a rose with a ruby in the middle and they kept that. And you know, that does show you this was a very touching family collection where you keep the mother's engagement ring. Yeah, I mean, every every family is at pieces, right? Where people say, like, I'll sell this, but I'm I'm definitely keeping mom's engagement ring or mom's favorite necklace. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned tiaras, and we also obviously Princess Margaret uh, Ayers put her beautiful tiara up for sale. We had two questions about tiaras, and they kind of both sent around this idea of, you know, what is the popularity and current demand for contemporary tiaras? And also, what about royal tiaras? When people buy them, do you get the sense that these are more collectible pieces or do people buy them and actually wear them to events? Yeah, that's, those are brilliant questions because I've certainly seen over the years a shift in attitude towards tiaras. I mean, I've only been around 20 years. Tiaras have been around for millennia, but there's been a recent shift um, commercially towards how they've been approached in the trade and I think certainly by, by people. Um, when I first started, I have a very clear memory of going to see a jewelry dealer and being shown a tiara and them saying to me, what do you think of this breaker? And the understanding a, a few decades ago was that tiaras really were just unusable and they were worth 
the value of the stones in them. And people would just knock out the stones and sell the stones because they weren't that wearable. That hasn't necessarily changed. It's not as if they've become more wearable now, but people are appreciating the, the historic value because of course, as time goes by, more tiaras get broken up, fewer tiaras left, the more rare they are. So what, where we are today is I think it would be extraordinarily unlikely for a, an old historic well-made signed tiara to be broken up, unlikely beyond all belief. Um, whether people are wearing them now, I don't think that's the answer. I think it's the fact that these have become beautiful objects that people understand the value with rarity and uniqueness. Um, I think they are being worn here or there. I certainly have worn tiaras in my time, not just for fun, but also uh, at, a, at a proper event. Um, and I'm sure people take the opportunity when they can. Um, I can think of a, a few modern tiaras who've been expressly made up for members of royal families in Europe. Um, there was a very famous Chaumet wave tiara, which was made recently um, for, uh, I forget which royal family, but it was the princess who's famous for swimming. And it was, she was a swimming uh, Olympic expert, uh, 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 a swimmer, and it was waves and water. So she wears that tiara. So pieces are still being made up and worn. It's just obviously within a certain um, tranche of society, which it always was to some extent. Okay, thank you very much. And I think when the Nishame was, what, didn't they recently put out a book on tiaras, Brecken? Is that right? Yeah. It might have been Shame we wrote about. Very cool looking yeah. book. Yeah. Um, so we, we have some pearl questions. So somebody asked about the, re, the origin of Marie Antoinette's pearl. They want to know, was it from the Gulf? Again, it's very much the, like the, the question for the Peregrina earlier. Um, it's much easier to do origin determination scientifically on a ruby or an emerald than it is to do the pearls. And I think some of the very modern pearl testing wasn't actually available to us uh, when these pieces were coming up for sale. But I can take a, a very wild but educated guess and say highly, highly likely that it was a pearl from the Gulf. Uh, because that's where all the best ones came from. It's like looking at those, um, the emerald from uh, Elizabeth Taylor, and you could say to me, where did it come from? I know there was a certificate saying it was Colombian. I didn't need the certificate. I uh, knew it was a Colombian emerald. I knew it was a Burmese ruby. It was very highly likely a gulf. Um, and uh, we had a comment here too, back to uh, Elizabeth Ter Taylor's, the La Peregrina, which means pilgrim for anyone who's interested. Um, I actually, we had someone comment that on the, uh, during the webinar that that was pearl was uh, pearl was from panama and so i double checked that was the smithsonian oh, and indeed the true. la peregrina uh was discovered in the gulf of panama in the 16th century do you know i was trying i was when i was saying gulf i was like i'm sure it was slightly further and i remembered it spot on whoever said that thank you very much because it's <laughs> exactly correct that was the well yeah. i mean there's been now i remember this there's been quite a lot of sort of fake histories on the the peregrine the, the peregrine the peregrina but you know there's these backgrounds that it goes to english royal families they weren't quite true um, mary the first but i think that panama one was um was one of the ones where they did say that's one of the earliest histories we can get on it so well known. thank you yes thank you to our listener who typed that in thank you very much um so we have another yeah. elizabeth taylor question um, are there any modern day celebrities who could be the heir to Elizabeth Taylor, so to speak? I, you know, somebody that collects jewelry on the level that she did. Oh, that's a tough question. Um, you know, when I think of celebrities and wearing jewelry, I think of red carpets and people borrowing jewelry. Um, I've seen such a, you know, there's such a, a huge um, desire by branded jewelers and high jewelry houses to have their pieces worn that you see them on the red carpet being lent. So when it comes to sort of people owning and building big collections, it doesn't come to my head. I mean, Brecken, have you got anyone? It doesn't I was just thinking, I can't think of, I can't think of anyone either. It'd be interesting to ask our fashion editor what she thinks, but I think you're right. And it's not necessarily also, I think when you hear people talk about jewelry, it's more about like, maybe not necessarily the high jewelry brands in the same way, as much as, you know, just the craft of it and that kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, we we always talk about uh, Deborah Messing because she's such a big jewelry fan and she follows us on National Jeweler, so I love to, but she's such a big proponent of jewelry in general. 
I mean, I, I mean, I was Ellen Barkin, but of course she sold the collection as well. So you know, these these collections are being amassed. It's just we don't often know how prolific they are until they come back up for sale. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Someone in the chat just mentioned Ellen Barkin, who auctioned off her collection after her divorce. Someone else just suggested Victoria Beckham and her rings, which I guess would be, I don't know. It's I don't know. Oh, so much possibly. Beckham, but. Yeah, Victoria Beckham said to have a different engagement ring in every color. <laughs> and you see her wearing these oh reds and God. greens and big diamonds. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. That would be great to know. <laughs> I mean, it might not be a question we know until, you know, somebody passes away or decides to sell their collection, because who knows, there could be someone out there, a celebrity who's, you know, what if Meryl Streep has been quietly collecting jewelry for decades and we just don't know about it? Yeah, they're just not as, maybe it's obvious, because Liz Taylor obviously was, like, photographed so much in all of them, but maybe someone has, like, stashed away and it'll just surprise us at auction. That would be awesome. Just kind of a quiet collector. Yeah. Um, we have some questions now about the loose stones we saw towards the end of the presentation. Uh, one listener wants to know, the color of the Farnes blue is often compared to the Hope Diamond. Do you think there's a chance that the Farnes, and I'm sorry if I'm not saying that right, that the Farnes blue was a part of the original blue diamond that the Hope was cut from? And there's so been a lot, a lot of speculation over the years generally about what other stones was this stone a sister stone of the hope etc cetera, etc cetera. i had not heard that about this particular diamond though well i mean the, the initial speculation because this came up earlier for sale was the Wittelsbach, and there was a lot of uh, work done and initially speculation that maybe the Wittelsbach, the oval 35 character on the right that that was part of the original hope diamond because the, the original the hope diamond they've now worked out was part of what was called the french blue which was part of the french crown jewels and was lost during this robbery in the 18th century. Um, so the hope, of course, now in the Smithsonian, was nearly very likely cut from that original table cut. And there's always been discussion whether there have been other blues that have come from that as well. They proved recently that the Wittelsbach did not come from the same stone. The and as, you, as you mentioned, it was the Smithsonian that did. Uh, you're right, it was the Wittelsbach. I couldn't think of which stone, but it was the Smithsonian that published a long research paper, I believe, um, on, you know, did the, were the Wittelsbach, later the Wittelsbach graph and the Hope the same stone. So if anybody exactly. wants to look that up, that's, uh, that was the original um, investigation. I'm sorry. Yeah, and it was ahead. brilliantly yeah. done. No, actually, you can show you dead right. And it was, it was brilliantly done research. You know, if you, please look it up because if you're really interested in diamond history, it's fascinating and very well done. Um, the Farnese, I mean, you know, it's, it's quite a small, a small stone at sort of six carats. So, and I don't think anyone's actually done the sort of chemical research on it to know. Um, all I can tell you is that when I saw it, it was dark. Um, it, I remember it wasn't the same as the other blues or the middles, but not the same reaction. It was quite a heavy, dark stone. And I really don't have the impression the hope was quite the same. Um, but that's a personal feeling. <laughs> Um, okay. And um, we have somebody who chimed in um, about uh, knowing who has a lot of jewelry today. And uh, this listener says, Kim Kardashian is an unfortunate example of becoming a target for crime if you show that you have very expensive jewelry. So we may not have people who get identified as collectors any longer. For those who don't know, a few years back, Kim Kardashian was in Paris and was robbed in a hotel room, millions of dollars. I don't remember if they took just one diamond or a lot of jewelry, but um, and she had been, I mean, I think her family's whole kind of stock and trade is being public. So she had been quite public about showing her jewels yeah. on Instagram. And I think she's even said in subsequent interviews that she's kind of cut back on that, but very scary and unfortunate for her. Um, but and I think if I remember rightly, how they found out was because she'd been publishing on Instagram her movements that day. So they even knew that she'd left the hotel where she was staying. And that's yeah. how they... They had the information. I mean, it's just a reminder how dangerous social media is to some extent. Yeah, it's a great point too, because it is sort of like with today's social media, you'd think that we'd know exactly who the jewelry collectors are, but at the same time, that technology, you know, the other side of the coin is that they're sort of easier to follow and track down. So it would make sense that they were a little quieter with their collection. And I've just had a, I just had a message from a friend of mine who is listening in and has just said, well, Jennifer Tilly's also got a very good collection. Of jewelry. Oh, oh, good one. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so I think we have one question left here. Um, 
and this is a good wrap up question for you, Helen, what has been your personal favorite piece that you've handled? Like of all, all the pieces you've ever seen, everything we've looked at here today, can you, you have to narrow it down to one. <laughs> Which one would you pick if you can have one of them? If I could have one. Yeah, what one would you pick? Do you pick? know what? I know exactly which one I would want to own, purely on the basis that I was never allowed to wear it. And I would like to own the Baltimore Tiara because one of the rules that they gave us, I mean, I was the, the only female specialist allowed to handle these jewels during the sale. I was with this tiara. I lived with it for six months. You know, I took it on all these great sort of uh, shows and, and, um, and visits around the world but we were not allowed to wear the jewelry. And of course I took my job very seriously. I never tried it on. And if I could own one piece, I would own the Baltimore tiara so that I could actually put it on my head. <laughs> have to try that. <laughs> okay, well, we'll put, the, we'll put that out in the, the world for you. Uh, not that anyone asked me, but I want the Catherine the Great Emerald. Oh, do you? <gasps> yeah, I really, I'd like that. So if anybody's you know looking to donate that, um, Brecken, any favorites? Brecken, yeah. I was just going to say the other tiara from Maria Jose, the one with the briolettes that <laughs> hung down. Because I also would want to try it on, but I just want to see the movement. And I like this structure of the, the arches on it. And so beautiful. But I would take any of them if anyone wants to know. So. <laughs> yeah, just in case anyone's listening. Yeah. Um, Helen and Brecken, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an excellent discussion. And thank you so much to our audience. They were so knowledgeable and fun and engaging. I had a great time here today. Um, you can tune in for another episode of My Next Question next Tuesday, October 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Our senior editor, Ashley Davis, is hosting a session called The Online Vintage Jewelry Boom how a new generation sells antiques on Instagram. And she'll be interviewing Elizabeth Potts, founder and owner of the Moonstones and Mia Grafham, owner and curator of Farewell Fine Jewelry. Uh, you can read more about it and register at nationaljeweler.com slash webinars. Um, and thank you again for joining us today and please take care. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Helen. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Fabulous, so much fun.